Hi everybody. So today we are going to be talking about the uh, central nervous system and finishing up that PowerPoint. Uh, we are starting by going over the concept of blood-brain barrier. Uh, if you guys recall, uh, blood-brain barrier is created by a specific cells called astrocytes uh, that are wrapping themselves around the capillary network and preventing a lot of the components that are present in blood to exit the uh, capillary network and uh, basically come into contact with your neurons. Uh, the main reason for that is because neurons are very sensitive to the environmental changes and uh, can be uh, influenced as a result of that. And you really don't want that to happen. Uh, so um, in terms of blood-brain barrier and what actually creates that, uh, first of all, you have tight junctions that are holding your uh, cells of the lining of the capillaries together. And if you go back to this picture, you can see these tight junctions right here. Uh, so if you have these cells right here, um, this is the gap between them and the gap is taken by the tight junctions. Uh, you also have again astrocytes wrapping themselves as these blue structures um, and these blue structures again prevent leakage of material uh, from the capillary network into your mm, neurons that could possibly cause damage to them. Now there are certain molecules uh, that does pass through this blood-brain barrier that includes oxygen and carbon dioxide uh, some of the hormones that are uh, produced and are secreted by the brain itself. That being said, uh, there are parts of the brain that do lack this uh, blood-brain barrier, and the main structure would be your hypothalamus, uh, because hypothalamus is involved in creating a lot of the homeostatic feedback loops that we have in terms of water, temperature, and metabolic activity. So they do need to have direct access to the blood vessels and therefore blood uh, to check to make sure that everything is running basically smoothly. Now the last few slides of this PowerPoint um, um, is focused on uh, looking at some of the medical conditions associated with the brain. Uh, the, the common one that we hear for brain injuries is concussions. Uh, remember that uh, around your brain, you do have the fluid, cerebrospinal fluid, uh, with the goal of protection uh, of the brain. Uh, however, if the trauma is severe enough, then uh, your brain will bounce off inside the skull, and that can cause bruising of the brain tissue. Now, um, having one concussion, if it's not severe enough, could not or will not uh, cause a significant damage to the brain. However, if you have repetitive concussions, like what you will see in football players or boxers, a uh, lot of sports, um, contact sports, um, then uh, there is a chance that uh, these individuals will later on develop um, other uh, brain um, conditions uh, that will affect their basically living style. Subdural hemorrhage is another condition you see. Again, this is associated with trauma. Um, this is where uh, blood vessels that are found in, uh, within the brain or within the intracranial space are ruptured. Uh, and a very common reason for that would be accidents or blood force trauma. Um, and a rupturing of these blood vessels uh, slowly allows the blood to pull inside the skull. Now understand that if you're looking at this, um, as the blood pools, on one side you have the skull, which is a hard structure, and on the other side you have the brain, which is a soft tissue. So as this hematoma, as this blood is gathering inside the skull, it slowly pushes down on the brain. So typically if somebody has a subdural hemorrhage, at the earlier stages, they don't have any symptoms as the brain tissue has not been suppressed. Uh, so uh, as the fluid starts to accumulate within that gap and the brain tissue starts to be pushed down, uh, then you will see symptoms like loss of a speech or when they do talk, the words do not make sense. Um, they eventually um, will lose consciousness uh, and um, if it's not treated, it can lead to loss of uh, blood pressure and uh, heart rate as well as respiration. Uh, which basically 
means death. Now, what is the best way to treat an individual with subdural hemorrhage? Is that they drill a hole through the skull and uh, basically drain the fluid that is creating pressure on the brain tissue. Uh, they do need to uh, fix the ruptured blood vessel uh, because if they don't know, they don't do that, the issue will continue. On this picture, what we have is a transverse cut of the uh, brain tissue. What you see around, and uh, that's the brain, and this area where you see in the dark, uh, that's the hematoma, which actually pushed the gray uh, structure, which is your brain tissue, inward. Notice that the gray tissue, which is your brain, is all the way to the skull on this side. However, in here you have this kind of a blackened spot. Now, cerebrovascular accident, which is commonly known as a stroke. There are two types of this. It could be as a result of hemorrhage or a clot that um, basically results in uh, part of the brain tissue either uh, not receiving enough oxygen supply uh, or the bleeding in that uh, tissue basically causes uh, damage to the neurons within the area. Now, regardless of what is the reason for the stroke, uh, part of the brain tissue will die. As you can see, the blackened area in both of these pictures. Now, uh, a common symptoms of a person with a stroke is paralysis in the opposite side of their body. Uh, this should sound really familiar to you guys since we have talked about the concept of control lateral quite a few times as the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body and vice versa. Um, another symptoms of a stroke is ability, inability to speech or create uh, words and uh, sensory deficiencies. Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is something that you hear a lot nowadays, again, um, in uh, terms of elderly being affected. It is a degenerative brain disease uh, where uh, the neurons um, are going to be destroyed as a result of uh, protein built up inside the brain. As these proteins build up, um, they are limiting the access of the neurons to nutrients. And as these neurons die uh, and their neighboring neuron dies, uh, the, basically your body or your brain cleans them up, uh, leaving these gaps where used to be filled with neurons. Please do understand that your body is unable to regenerate or uh, create new neurons through the process of cell division. So when these neurons die, um, literally you are losing them forever. So if you take a look at the pictures I have, uh, you have a normal uh, brain tissue, uh, looks very healthy versus a person with Alzheimer's. Um, it kind of looks like a deflated balloon. Uh, if you look at the internal uh, structures in terms of gray matter and white matter, you can see significant degradation of the brain tissue. And you really can expect a brain that looks like this will work uh, in its fullest capacity. Uh, so common symptoms of this, again, would be memory loss and um, short attention span, and eventually it does expand to other parts of the body, uh, which eventually leads to death. Uh, Parkinson's disease uh, is another uh, medical condition. Uh, Parkinson's is when you have a decrease in level of a neurotransmitter, better known as dopamine. Uh, this is the neurotransmitter that uh, gives you the uh, feel good um, condition. Uh, now, under normal condition, you produce a specific amount of dopamine as neurotransmitters which interact with uh, the receptors on uh, the secondary neuron or postsynaptic neurons. And that interaction is basically essential in terms of um, muscle activity. However, um, what happens is with a person with Parkinson's, uh, the level of dopamine being released from the neurons uh, significantly declines. And therefore, the neurons that were interacting with that dopamine, the receptors that were interacting with that dopamine become super active. Uh, think about it as they say, oh, I'm not getting as much, so whenever I get some, I'm going to get super excited about it. 
uh, that reason, uh, for that reason, uh, these individuals starts to have a very overactive neurons, uh, which in some cases, in many cases, causes uh, excessive tremoring of the uh, skeletal muscles. Uh, so a common symptoms of um, Parkinson's disease is tremors in both hands and feet. Uh, the person usually does not have perfect control over their skeletal muscles. Uh, their steps are different. They usually take a smaller steps. Um, and again, this is something that is associated with a neurotransmitter, uh, dopamine. Huntington disease is, uh, in terms of um, what the brain would look like, is very similar to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, you can notice the degradation of the brain tissue. It is a result of accumulation of a specific protein called Huntington protein. Now, under normal condition, this protein will not be accumulated. However, if you have the genetic disposition, uh, there is mutation within this protein. And as a result of the accumulation of these proteins within the brain tissue, uh, that leads to the neuron death and degradation of the cerebral cortex um, or cerebrum in general. These, um, the common symptoms of the Huntington disease is flapping or jerky motions of the limbs, uh, mental deterioration. So again, as the brain is losing its um, functionality and the neurons are dying, uh, the mental deterioration takes place. And in later stages, uh, it will lead to death of uh, the individual. Moving on, the next part that we're going to talk about is cranial nerves. Um, so cranial nerves, there are a total of 12 nerves. Uh, we have uh, discussed these nerves in terms of your uh, pons, medulla oblongata, and midbrain. Uh, we said uh, nerve number 3 to 12 are associated with your brain stem. So nerve cranial nerve number one and two are not associated with brain stem, and they're basically your sense of associated with your sense of a smell and your sense of uh, vision. So cranial number cranial nerve number one or CN number one uh, is associated with your sense of a smell and it's known as the olfactory nerve. Cranial nerve number two is your optic nerve, which is associated with your vision, collecting data and sending that to the occipital lobe. Now for the other nerves, uh, we already discussed them again in terms of which part of the uh, brainstem they're associated with. So we wanna briefly go over the name of these. Uh, cranial nerve number three is known as oculomotor nerve. Cranial nerve number four is trochlear nerve. And then both of these are associated with your midbrain. Uh, for the lecture concerning uh, the information about the function of these nerves, I don't require you guys to know that information. However, it is extremely important for you guys to uh, know them for your um, nursing program as it is an essential component of your um, funda fundamental concepts of nursing. Now nerves associated with your pons are nerve number five, six, and seven, uh, which is the trigeminal nerve, abducent nerve. Um, and these nerves are essential in terms of controlling the, uh, controlling different aspects of the facial and uh, facial muscles, or uh, they're associated with your sensory innervation. Um, medulla oblongata, which is the last part of your brainstem, are associated with cranial nerve number nine all the way through number 12. And the most important nerve that I do want you guys to know uh, is cranial nerve number 10, which is called the vagus nerve. Um, the function that I do want you guys to note is uh, the importance of it in peripheral nervous system. Uh, we'll talk about this in our next PowerPoint uh, when we're discussing uh, the autonomic nervous system. And they are responsible for uh, kind of um, 
uh, uh, slowing down uh, the activity of the autonomic nervous system, which is better known as parasympathetic nervous system. So just remember cranial number 10 or vagus nerve is associated with parasympathetic uh, nervous system. Here is a picture, again, really good picture for you guys to review, um, uh, but that information will not be covered in your lecture exam. Here's another depiction of the same information. Now, moving on to the second part of the central nervous system, uh, we have uh, a spinal cord. Uh, we have discussed this again previously that a spinal cord uh, has total, total of 31 pairs of nerves. Uh, they are broken down to the cervical region uh, for a total of eight nerves, a uh, total of 12 nerves associated with the thoracic, um, Number five, uh, associated with your lumbar, L1 through L5. Uh, five, associated with your sacral, uh, again, S1 through S5. And a single nerve associated with the coccyx, coccyx called the coccygeal nerve. Now, what is the function of the spinal cord? Uh, it is acting as a relay station between the rest of the body and your brain. Uh, basically, if you have any data uh, that needs to come in or go to your brain, uh, they pass through the spinal cord. And if a data needs to go from your brain out back to the body, it also passes through the spinal cord. Uh, it is also extremely important in coordination and creating repetitive motions. And lastly, is it is the part of the nervous system that controls reflexes of the skeletal muscle. For instance, if you are touching a surface that is hot, uh, that surface, uh, and then you pull your hand away involuntarily, that is your spinal cord controlling your skeletal muscle. So the signal does not rely on the primary motor cortex of the uh, nervous system or central nervous system, uh, rather it rely on the spinal cord creating a fast loop uh, to prevent any further damage to the tissue. Now, when we're looking at the nerves throughout the body, these 31 pairs of nerves, the first thing I want you guys to understand is that these nerves are microscopic in structure, uh, which imply that they uh, do contain, they are visible um, if you are looking at a cadaver and completing a dissection process. Now, the largest structure we have, which is the actual whole nerve, uh, has a connective tissue wrapped around it, which is what you see kind of uh, peeling off um, on the back. So this is structure right here. Uh, this is the outermost lining or connective tissue that's wrapped around uh, the spinal nerve, and that is referred to as the epineurum. Uh, now, if you look at the whole nervous structure, it's made up of these the smaller units. So there is, for instance, four of these units. Uh, each of these are referred to as a fascicle. And again, notice around this fascicle, you have this connective tissue, which is called the perineuron. So perineuron, if you look at them, so if you open up a fascicle, what you have, again, you have these individual structure being pulled out, and these are going to be individual neurons. So what you can see at the smallest units are your neurons that are being peeled up, pulled out, and they also have a very loose connective tissue wrapped around them called the endoneuron. Please do note that the endoneurum covers the myelin sheath, so it is not actually uh, underneath the myelin sheath. So you have the myelin sheath and then you have the endoneurum. So again, kind of looking at this, and uh, these tiny, tiny structures you have that are these tiny circles, these are individual neurons that are wrapped with endoneurum. If you put them in larger structures, like what we have here, or what we have here, uh, these would be identified as fascicles, and the blue lining around the fascicles is called perineurum. 
and uh, the whole structure I have here, that's one whole nerve, uh, and the connective tissue wrapped around that would be epineurum, uh, with the gola basically holding the whole structure. Uh, you also will see the blood vessels that are located inside the whole nerve, uh, supplying all of the nerve cells within that structure. And one last word that we have is the word neurolemma. Uh, neurolemma is referred to the plasma membrane of the nerve cells um, that um, the Schoen cells that are wrapped around the axons of the neurons. Um, so um, there is a specific word neuro implying that they're associated with the nervous system. Now, when we look at the spinal cord, uh, a spinal cord like your brain uh, does contain both um, gray matter and white matter. Uh, so the gray matter of the spinal cord has this kind of a butterfly shape, and I'm gonna just kind of draw this for you guys. It has three pieces to it. And these three pieces are, um, begin in the gray matter that is located within the white matter. Uh, so if you guys think about the brain, your brain is um, more superficial aspect of it was the gray matter, and the more um, internal structure was the white matter. However, in this case, uh, in the areas of the spinal cord, the gray matter is deep inside the white matter. Now, uh, the naming for both the white matter and the gray matter is directly associated to the front versus back. So before we even name anything, we first need to identify if these structures are in front or back. So the way I do this is um, looking for these structures. So right here, you have the white opening. And right here on this side, you only have a single line. So from the terminology we learn from the central nervous system, if you have a, a shallow groove, that shallow groove is referred to as the sulcus. And if the opening is wide, we refer to this as the fissure. So the difference here is uh, if you're talking about the fissure, fissure is identifying the anterior aspect and the sulcus is identifying the posterior aspect of your uh, spinal cord. So now that I have the anterior and posterior, the anterior is referred to as anterior median fissure, and the line in back is the posterior median sulcus. So how do I name the gray matter? This part would be referred to as the anterior gray horn, the one on the side would be lateral gray horn, and the one in the back would be the posterior gray horn. The white matter right here would be the dorsal or posterior white column. The one on the side would be the um, lateral white column, and the one in front would be the anterior or ventral white column. Now, the other structure you see is the point of attachment for the right and left of the uh, spinal cord. So that point of attachment, that midsection right here is referred to as the gray commissure. And right at the center of your gray commissure, you have this opening called the central canal. And central canal is basically uh, where your cerebrospinal fluid flows. Uh, this should remind you of um, where we have talked about the brain ventricles. Uh, the last ventricle in brain was the fourth ventricle, which we said continues down the spinal cord, passing through the central canal, and the central canal is basically, again, where we have the fluid. Now, you also have these tiny branches coming off of the spinal cord at the beginning. These are called rootlets which are merging together to form this larger structure uh, which are identified as roots. So you have the uh, one that is in the back, the posterior root, and the one you have in the front, which would be your anterior root. Now, it's not depicted here, but if I continue going this way, then there is a crossing over happening right here, and you continue going again to the back and to the front. When this crossing happened, these structures are now known as ramus, if we're talking about one, and if we're talking about both of them, they're called rami. So the ones that are more medial to your spinal cord, these are roots, ventral and dorsal. 
and after the crossing, the structure becomes ramus, again, ventral ramus and dorsal ramus. And what you also have here, which I didn't talk about, is the, the enlargement uh, that you have um, at the dorsal aspect right here. Uh, this is called dorsal root ganglion. Uh, this is basically where you have the cell body of many neurons uh, located inside this space. And because cell bodies are kind of like the larger of the structures within the neuron, uh, they become a very pronounced structure which becomes the ganglion. Uh, do notice that again, the ganglions are visible on both sides of the spinal cord. So they're not limited to uh, left or right. Okay, I'm going to stop the PowerPoint here and then we'll continue the next recording after.